We have before us tonight the first of a series of four studies we're doing on the papacy. Chapter 12 is a foundation and it rolls forward through to chapter 18 and we'll, we'll cover the, that story across four evenings. Now that, what you're seeing on the screen there, we're trying to depict what this chapter is basically about. You've got the woman on the left who is no longer an ecclesia, properly called a church because they have she is now with child, as we read in that chapter. She is a corrupted virgin. So we now have the church developed from the first century Ecclesia coming into the 300s, the fourth century. And that's how things have developed from those ecclesial days through now to becoming a church with a whole lot of wrong ideas, primarily about Jesus Christ, the Trinity we're going to see had developed to this time and would develop further later on. So it was a corrupted congregation that was in the Roman Empire, but it had spread through the apostles' work. It had spread through the Roman Empire and the Christian people, so-called, were now a force to be reckoned in the Roman Empire. And that's where the third character was not reckoned there. Constantine comes into this chapter. That red dragon thing there is a representation of the Roman Empire in its pagan form, which Constantine overthrew. And that's what chapter 12 is about, because it's the basis on which the Roman church eventually was able to grow and become really the monstrosity that it is today. Now, I've borrowed freely from all these sources and all those brethren with their PowerPoints, a little bit of originality here and there, but not much. Most of it's borrowed from all of those brethren's work, and they're, they're happy about that. There's two books I think I would recommend primarily if you just want to get started on these subjects. There's one by Brother Greg Palmer. It's just come out on Revelation, simply Revelation. It's a really, really good expression. We know our Brother Greg. He writes clearly, and this book here is no exception. Very easy to read and get the hang of what those chapters are all about. And The Old Faithful by Brother Roberts, 13 Nectures, is a really good read front to back of the whole of the book. Now, when you look at Revelation, if you count up the verses, there's 31% of those verses in Revelation relate to the papacy, and 39% to kingdom visions. Our Lord chose that kind of breakup for his message to the brethren and sisters and to us across the last 2,000 years. He knew all power was given into his hand all knowledge and authority was given from his father to him and he knew what was going to happen across that 2,000 years. And he wrote this book so that his faithful brethren and sisters would be able to grab hold of what was happening and maintain their faith. And a big factor across those 2,000 years would be the papal system and its oppression of the believers. Here's the first verse, we know it so well. Three key features we want to point out here. It's the final words of our Lord, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. We must put revelation alongside the four Gospels. We know how important they are to our personal life, our development in Christ and the qualities we should develop. But the Lord chose to write these chapters for all the generations from John's time right through to our day. And he makes that point in verse 1. God gave this message to his son, things which must shortly come to pass. John wrote around AD 96, that's pretty well agreed. And so this book covers history from that time right down to our day. Why do I emphasise that? Well, there are variations to the themes we're going to present, to present tonight. I'm not going to go into those. But most of them don't comply with that simple test right there, that it's a continuous history that the Lord presented for his servants across those 2,000 years. He did it, of course, by signs. He signified it, symbols. You just think about it for a minute. How is the Lord going to tell people in the Middle Ages people in our time, about things that were happening in their world and give them the core thread 
of history across 2,000 years. But he's going to have to do it with symbols because some of these things are in existence. You look at that one in Revelation 9 verse 10, just quickly. Here's a good example. The time of the fifth angel, the Islamic peoples coming from the east, and it says they had tails like to scorpions, and the stings were in their tails. What on earth is that? Well, that was the cannons. But how is the Lord going to describe a cannon that belched out fire and smoke and balls at that time? How is he going to do that? Well, that's why the symbols are used. And he takes here a scorpion whose sting was in the tail. And the Muslim people would race along on their horses with the cannons behind, swing them around and fire off their cannon. Another example of the French Revolution. How is the Lord going to describe the rising up of the common people? And the croaking of the democracy, of liberty, fraternity, equality, but by the symbol of the frog. And so these symbols, brethren and sisters, are very, very appropriate throughout the record. Let's come to chapter 12 then. We have this symbol here in verse 1, the wonder of the woman in heaven. Now again, heaven is a symbol. It's not talking about God's reign. Heaven and earth are political symbols of the powers that be and the people that are ruled. We could go to either of those passages, Isaiah 1 or Ephesians 6. Let's look at Isaiah 1, perhaps. It's very clear. And the Lord, time and time again, takes us back to the Old Testament to uh, (coughs) establish the issues that he's making about history that was to come. Isaiah 1 verse 2, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. Is he talking about God's throne and the literal earth? We come to verse 10. Hear the word of Yahweh, ye rulers of Sodom, and ye people of Gomorrah. So there's your heavens and your earth. It's the ruling authorities and the people that are ruled. Now, this woman, this church as she has become, is now there in the political heavens. She has become dominant in the political scene in that fourth century. She has on her head a crown of 12 stars, and there was, in the time of John, through that century, that first century, 12 Caesars, one for each of those stars. And this is borne out in this record by this uh, Gaius Tonius, a historian who actually wrote in that very time, and he wrote about those 12 Caesars. Here's their names. You don't need to know them, but from the beginning of the first century through to the end, there were 12 of those emperors. And they are represented on the head of that church because she has now become entwined with the rulership of the Roman Empire. And the woman is the corrupted bride of Christ. Why corrupted? Well, she's with child, as it says there in verse 2. 280 days, the period of gestation, AD 33, around that time, the Lord's crucifixion and the formation of the Ecclesia, 280 years we come to the time of Constantine, around 312, 313. No longer an ecclesia, now a church, aligned with the politics of the day. Here's the quote in 2 Corinthians 11. I put it up here because it's actually quite an important quote to establish the position of the church. When the ecclesia was formed, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11 that he was jealous over them with a godly jealousy because they were a chaste virgin to Christ. That's how the ecclesia began, uncorrupted. But he says, I'm fearing lest, just like that devil in the beginning, beguiled Eve, and that's going to become important here because the dragon is the great Satan, just as she was corrupted by his subtlety, so I'm fearing that she'll be taken away from the simplicity in Christ. And what's the first issue he mentions? 
he that cometh preaches another Jesus. Now that was the core issue through those first two to three centuries. Was Jesus, did Jesus come in the flesh? How was he the son of God? Was he part God and part man? And all these debates raged through those 200 years, as Paul says, they would be corrupted, looking for another Jesus. As John said through his Gospels, all the time, beware, you must assert that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. And that was certainly the issue at that time when Constantine and the church came together. Here's a book, uh, if you are interested in that subject, I won't go into any detail with it, there's the Jewish writer, so he's not biased one way or the other, but he makes the case for when Jesus became God across those two to three centuries. The nature of Christ, another Jesus, was what was known as the Arian dispute during the time of Constantine and beyond, which led eventually to the formation of the idea of the Trinity. So that's where the church was in that fourth century. She has the sun behind her. She's part of that ruling civil government. Son, of course, if you think of Malachi 4 verse 2, the son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. She had the son, but it was the son of the civil authorities. The moon at her feet. The moon is a reflection of the sun's rays. The ecclesia should be the reflection of the glory of God. But the church had become the reflection now of those corrupted religious ideas. So we have chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, the second major character, Great Red Dragon. Now, Great Red Dragon is representing the fierce, fiery, pagan Roman Empire, headed up at that time by three rulers, as we shall see in a moment. It was a red dragon, because red's a very prominent symbol of sin, as we know. We can, again, look at all those passages and see how red uh, uh, does symbolise sin. But it was a fiery empire. It was always at war with its neighbours, with the tribes at the north. So being a great red dragon was a very, very apt symbol for the imperial Roman pagan empire as it was at that time. Seven heads. Why did this monstrosity have seven heads? Well, Rome is formed on seven hills, isn't it? There were seven heads of Rome's government from the time of its beginning back in 700 odd, right through to the final stage of that empire with the Gothic, Gothic kingdom of Rome in 476 to 533. So there were seven forms of government. So it had seven heads this dragon, seven types of rulership that changed across those centuries. Ten horns. You remember the ten toes of Daniel's image, of course, and that's exactly the parallel that's being formed there. These are the northern European barbarian territories that overthrew the western leg of the Roman Empire. And so it had ten uh, horns and seven heads, but the next statement is very, very significant about that dragon, that Roman Empire. Where were the crowns? They were upon the seven heads. In other words, in this fourth century, time of Constantine, the Roman Empire was still intact. Western and Eastern, there were very divisions around the place. But at this point, the Roman Empire was still intact and still in control. And the Lord signifies that to his brethren and sisters of that age by saying the crowns are still upon the heads of this empire. They were the seven forms of government, regal through to Gothic. When John wrote, there was Nero upon the throne just before him and others that followed. And right through to the time of Constantine, it was an imperial system. It was the sixth head that was ruling throughout this time up until 
chapter 12. What about that dragon? The tail through the third part of the stars. The empire was divided into three parts. Now, brethren and sisters, our Lord is in control. Our Lord is superintending the history of these times. And he's telling his brethren and sisters in that era, this is what your world is going to look like in the fourth century. Now, there was quite a bit of confusion with the leadership of the Roman Empire around this time. Diocletian was one of those imperial rulers, but then it got split up. You had Constantius, who was Constantine's, who was Constantine's father. You had Galerius, who was in Rome, fiddling around with all sorts of power issues. You had Maximum, who was right across in the east, and you had Licinius, who was in the central Illyricum <coughs> region. So it was quite a muddle. And Constantine took over from Constantius, his father. Galerius and the others continued. Galerius died, and Constantine inherited entirely the central and northern section from Rome up into Europe of that empire. And this is what it looked like. There wasn't one emperor, there were three, just like the Lord said. The tail of that dragon would draw a third part of the stars of heaven. And the empire was divided into three parts. Constantine, central and north, Licinius in the Alevican Peninsula, Maximum across there in the east. And so, in verse 5, the corrupted ecclesia, the church, brought forth their champion, who was going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. He wasn't at that point. It's only one third of that kingdom. But he was going to rule all of them with a rod of iron. And he was caught up to God and his throne. He, he ascended the imperial title, at least one third of it, when his father died. And Constantine became eventually Rome's first Christian emperor. So we read in verses 7 to 9, there's a war in heaven. Michael and his angels, they fight with the great dragon and his angels. And there was no place found anymore in heaven for all of them. The great dragon was cast out. And the Lord says, that old dragon is the devil and Satan. And he is referring there, we'll see what he's getting at there in a moment. But the dragon's your Roman Empire in entirety, and it's the pagan section of it led by, first of all, Maximum, and then Licinius. There were three of them. Licinius initially supported Constantine, and they fought against Maximum, who was supporting the old ways, the old traditions. Let's not change all these things. These two guys want to change it all. And he supported paganism against uh, Constantine and Licinius. But Constantine prevailed in the will of God. In 312, there was what battles called the Milvian Bridge. He defeated Maxentius. The history is uh, it's pretty interesting, but it gets pretty muddled. Maxentius was a proxy for Maximum. He offered to take the place. He was obviously hoping to, to jump up the line somewhat, but he lost. And in the process, he pulled Maximum down with him. And Constantine, according to the fables, whether it's true or not, we don't know, but supposedly saw a sign of the cross and he became convinced then that he needed to have the Christians on his side. So having defeated Maximum in the east, there was only two rulers left now, Constantine and Licinius. And Licinius decided that he would now take up the mantle of the protector of pagan Rome and their, all of their old traditions. And so once again, we have that battle between Constantine, who had adopted the church as his champions, and Licinius, who wanted to stay with the old ways. And verse 12 of chapter 12 says, The devil is come down to you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. 
12 years was all he had, though he didn't know it. But he had a very short time to continue those old traditions of that Roman pagan empire until he was finally defeated by Constantine in the Battle of Chrysopolis in AD 324. Constantine at that point became sole ruler of the entire Roman Empire. But he knew that things were not well in that empire. He had established his authority up there in Europe and even in Britain. And now he was centred in Rome and he knew the power of those tribes in the north and he could see what was coming. So he actually shifted the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome across to Constantinople, over in the east. And it remained a Christian fortified city until eventually the Muslims took it over in the year 1453. It lasted another thousand years because Constantine had the wisdom to shift it to Constantinople. But in so doing, he shifted the Roman Empire, now Christian but previously dragon, he now shifted that into Constantinople and that becomes significant as history unfolded. I read in verse 9 there that this great dragon is called the devil and Satan. The Lord very deliberately puts that as expressions into that record. We know these passages, 1 Peter 5 verse 8, Peter's speaking in the time of Nero, that mad emperor who persecuted the Christians, burnt them as oil, as it were. And he says, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, is going about to devour you. And so that expression to make the pagan Roman Empire equivalent to the devil was very, very appropriate. So in Ephesians 6, contrast here, what we heard on Monday night when uh, uh, our brother spoke there about being in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, in this case, the heavenlies were spiritual wickedness, the darkness of the world, principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world, the wiles of the devil. So Revelation there, this great dragon was cast out, but he was the symbol of the devil and Satan. Now we're just sort of making a nice gloss over of these events. Well, here's the New Penguin Atlas, not any of our writings at all, history writing, reputable one. The fourth century saw the triumph of the Christian church. At the century start, Christians were still a persecuted minority, but by its end, but the idea that the emperor might be other than a Christian had become unthinkable. Church and state had fused to form a new society, Christendom, and there became the basis of the Catholic system as it developed in the centuries to come. The fusion of the powers of the state and the church. We don't understand that today. The church can have no control over civil authorities in our country. So that's been well established since the French Revolution. But it was not so through those Middle Ages. And the church and the state now have the power, combined power, to force its will upon the inhabitants of the world. And that happened when Constantine merged the Christian people, so called, into his force with the Roman Empire, and he merged them together to form a new society which was to have tremendous impact on the Western world. Elsewhere in Revelation, you won't turn to them now, but the three earthquakes in Revelation, this is one of them. And why does the Lord describe it as an earthquake? For that reason. The second earthquake, the French Revolution. Why does he describe it as an earthquake? It changed entirely this whole process into the democracy that we now understand today. The third earthquake, we await when the Lord comes. In verses 10 to 12, we can read those verses and it seems to say almost 
that here is the kingdom of God. But it doesn't say that, does it, quite, if you read it carefully. In verse 10, I heard a loud voice, and it was in heaven. Now again, not in God's throne. Heaven is the ruling structure of the times. So in the court of Constantine, if you like, there was saying, now is come salvation, strength, the kingdom of our God. It's not God's kingdom. It's actually Constantine's kingdom, but the expressions are there, the power of his Christ. Our Christian brethren are with us and we've overcome the old pagan ways. The accuser has been cast down that persecuted us day and night. And they've overcome him by the cross, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. They love not their lives unto the death. Here's what Eusebius said at that time in respect to those days. He lived contemporary with Constantine. We're not talking about somebody later, but he was parallel with Constantine. He said, his adversary, Constantine, thus finally thrown down, the mighty victor Constantine, preeminent in every virtue, reunited the Roman Empire into a single whole. Light was everywhere, every city. The victorious emperor published decrees full of humanity. All tyranny had been purged away and the kingdom preserved securely. And even Constantine, in his reply to Eusebius, used those similar terms. A dragon having been deposed from governance by God's providence, now that liberty is restored, the dragon driven through the administration of public affairs by the providence of the supreme deity, we trust that all can be and all can see the efficacy of the divine power. So again, those words are couched as though it is the kingdom of God and that's how they saw it in those times with that great victory over ancient paganism. But it wasn't. It was the kingdom of Constantine and a corrupt church. Then we read in verse 15, a serpent cast out of his mouth, this is our dragon again, because he's the great serpent as well, a flood of water after the woman, that it might cause her to be carried away of that flood. And that's what Licinius tried to do. In those 12 short years, he tried to overturn all that Constantine had achieved, but of course he, he was a failure. Flood waters, well again, those symbols in those uh, chapters there. Perhaps look at the one in Isaiah 8 and verse 7. We haven't time to turn up all these passages, but uh, some of these are very, very clear. Isaiah 8 and verse 7. Here's where the kind of symbols of the waters come from. Now therefore, Isaiah says, Behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river, strong and many. Is it the waters? No, it's the king of Assyria and all his glory. So that's what's happening here. The power that Licinius had, he directed us trying to stamp out in vain the Christianity. So it says here, the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood. In verse 16 there of Romans uh, of Revelation chapter 12, the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood. So the earth, the common people, they became the protectors of the Christians. The ruling authority of Licentius and those tried to persecute through those 12 years and failed because the people generally supported the Christian people of that time. And so that's why the water was swallowed up and was not effective. And of course, Licentius was thrown out and the Christians were victorious. But it says in verse 6 and also in verse 14, the same point is made that the woman fled into the wilderness where a place was prepared for her of God that they should be fed 1,260 days. Now that's repeated in verse 14. So the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly to the wilderness into her place 
where she's nourished for a time, times and half a time, from the face of the serpent. Now, this chapter interchanges those two names, dragon, serpent, devil. It's all talking about the power of flesh in the pagan empire, but in any of those that were not related to the ways of Christ. Now, this stretches forward 1260 days, a day for a year, 1260 years, and we'll look at that in just a moment. But it says, the woman was given, in verse 14, two wings of a great eagle. Again, your eagle is a symbol of the Roman Empire. We won't turn those passages up, but Deuteronomy 28 speaks about the eagle, and so does the Lord in Matthew chapter 24 of the Roman powers. So it's a Roman eagle, but it's the wings of that eagle. And the brethren and sisters and those who opposed what was happening with Constantine and the church were forced to flee to the extremities of the Roman Empire. And that's why it says she was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly to the wilderness, to, to places beyond the central power and authority of the Roman Empire as it was then, first in Rome, then in Constantinople. And so that's where those who were persecuted now fled. They became witnesses to the Lord in all those places. We'll come back to that in a moment. But let's look at this point about time, times and a half, and 1260 days. Again, a book of symbol. So a day doesn't mean 24 hours, it's standing for something else. An hour doesn't mean a literal hour, it's standing for something else. The foundation is, come back to Numbers 14 and verse 34, seen several times in the Word of God. The other one is Ezekiel, where he, to lay on his side for so many days, uh, one time, and then turn over to the other side for another hundred odd days or more. But Numbers 14 and verse 34, you know Numbers 14. This is where Israel was sent out into the wilderness for their rebellion. And it says in verse 34, these very, very interesting words. God says to them through Moses, after the number of the days in which he searched the land, even 40 days, each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and you shall know my breach of promise. So they had rebelled against God, had spent 40 days searching out the land, had came back with 10 of the spies and evil reports. So God said, you accepted that report, you will now suffer for your iniquity. 40 days you are searching, 40 days you'll be in that wilderness in terms of 40 years. So that establishes this principle that in symbol, one day can represent a full year. The Lord said, perhaps look at that one too, John 11 and verse 9, he makes this comment, which is consistent with their way they operated their day, of course. John 11 and verse 9, Jesus answered and said, Are there not 12 hours in the day? Now, that was true for the Jewish day. It was 24 hours, 24 hours in a day, of course, but he was meaning from the morning to dusk is your 12 hours. That's when you can work, that's when you can do things. After that, it is time for rest and for sleep. And of course, as we know, that's very consistent from Genesis. The point we make there in Genesis 1, as we well know, the doesn't say morning to evening, does it? Like we would. Our day starts when we get up in the morning. But their day started in the evening before, from evening to morning. And uh, so that's how they describe their day. And uh, a night of 12 hours, a day of 12, day, 12 hours, 24 hours in which God created the earth in those six days. So 12 hours is a Jewish day. How would we convert that? If we're looking at an hour, if we've got 12 hours in a day, that equals one twelfth of a day. 
If we're going to convert one twelfth of a day with a day for a year, that equals 30 days. 12, 360 days in a Jewish year, so one twelfth gives you 30 days. So your one hour converts twice over into 30 days, and you'll find that consistent in the various places throughout the Revelation. And 30 days, of course, converts to 30 years. So the conversion in Revelation is ours. You have to convert twice to get to the day figure, 30 days, therefore 30 years. The days convert one for one, 1260 here will convert to 1260 years. But when you have years, like you do in Revelation 20, when you're talking about the millennium and the thousand-year reign of the Lord, they don't get converted. They're read as a literal time. So, to the woman were given two wings to fly to the wilderness for a time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. Now, we've got the two verses that we can put together there in our working out what this means. And 1260 is a year, two times two years, half a time half a year gives you your 1260 from verse 6. And that exactly equals a time times and a half time of verse 14. And as we see there's other passages, we won't go to them now, but they also refer to this time period of 1260. It's quite a significant time period. It brings us to the year 1572 in the calendar that the Lord is drawing up here. The persecution of the woman's seed was given wings to flee to the extremities of the empire, lasted for 1260 years, from the time of Constantine in 312 to 1572, there was a tremendous massacre of Huguenots on St. Bartholomew's Day in 1572. It wasn't the end of the persecution of the seed of the woman, but it was a very, very significant event. Catholic Europe rejoiced in the destruction of the Huguenot power. Many of the Huguenots converted over to the, to the Catholic cause. Here's a statement from Wikipedia about that event. Massacre marked a turning point in what were then known as the French Wars of Religion. The Huguenot political movement was crippled by loss of many of its prominent aristocratic leaders. Many rank and file members subsequently converted. Those who remained became radicalised. They gave up their faith and turned to taking up the sword. And it was by no means unique. The bloodletting was the worst of the century's religious massacres throughout Europe. And I want you to note these words from Wikipedia source. It printed on the Protestant minds the indelible conviction that Catholicism was a bloody and treacherous religion. And that's a very significant statement because that's exactly how the Lord describes it later on as we will get to those chapters in chapter 17. And 18. They went to the wings of the empire. They started with the Donatists down there in northern Africa, 312. They were the ones that fled from the persecutions of Licinius and the others, and even Constantine. They were opposed to the corruption that was there with the Christians. Right through the Huguenots there in France in 1572, and all those People was mentioned there, even the Reformation itself, were opposition to the corruption that was there started from Constantine's time forward. They were the wings of the empire. Now, those people listed there, the Arians, the Nazis, the Huguenots, and so on, all that we know about them doesn't seem to say that they knew the truth. They were opposed to the tyranny of the Catholic Church and the ruling authorities of the day, and they were witnesses against them. See, that's what that says there in Revelation 12, doesn't it? Verse 17, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. So there are two groups here. They were wroth with the woman as well as the remnant 
of her seed. And it is a testimony to the thoroughness of the Catholic Church. There is no record, apart from a bit that that brother unearthed in terms of the brethren in Poland, there's very, very precious little about the faith of our brethren and sisters through those 2,000 years. But the dragon and the woman were at conflict throughout that entire time. But it was not just the faithful. It spread, of course, to all of those who opposed the tyranny of the church and the authorities in those days. So that's where we will leave it for this evening. In verse 17 there, the remnant and her seed, they were amongst those people. And the common people of those times sheltered them through those times as our Lord watched over them and gave them this thread of history through those time periods. And that's what's so wonderful about the book of Revelation. It covers only Europe and the Middle East. It doesn't concern us with the rest of the world, America, China, India, Australia, whoever, or Asia. It's only concerned with that. And where is the focus of our world today? Still in the Middle East, still in Europe, because that's how our Lord has arranged and governed things for 2,000 years. And that's why he has set this thread here in the book of Revelation so that people, our brethren and sisters through those ages, could see that thread of history. Not all its detail, but the major thread. And there's no question that in the 4th century, the major thread was the joining of Constantine and the church as the foundation of that which was to come in the following centuries. Here is the patience of the saints. Here is the remnant of her seed that keep the commandments of God and have the faith and the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's who he was concerned with and that's why he wrote these records as he did, that they might realise, that we might realise God is in control. He's given that control to his son and his son has set the thread of history through 2,000 years till the days in which we live when it shall be brought to its culmination. Thank you.